Gosh, where do I begin? If I go far enough back, I guess school. Um, I think the one thing I can say about school is that I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do later on in life. Um, so a lot of school, I wasn't. I would, I would say I wasn't particularly a- academic. Um, went to a good school and, and got some good grades, but that was um, <laughs> that was just fortunate. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I, I toyed with the idea of I think becoming a solicitor at one point, um, but in the end. I decided to opt for uh, uh, humanities at university. I studied sociology and gender. Um, and what I didn't realize at the time was that that was kind of instilling within me a, an interest um, and kind of, I guess, approach to research as well that, um, that got me into the lines of kind of society and culture and understanding like these big macro trends, but from a people perspective. and. Um, I think I only really put two and two together later on in life because I always wondered where that kind of sense of um, interest uh, sparked from originally. Um, But I think it probably would have been university. Um, And then uh, when I left university, a friend of mine came up to me and just asked, you know, do you want to set up a business together? Um, And back then, I mean, we're talking 20 years ago now. So back then it was the internet was the only industry that we could see where we could credibly talk about it and people would believe us because we were young and therefore young equals knowledge about all things digital. Um, so we were just building websites and kind of things like that. Um, I mean, we were effectively salesmen. They, we had um, a team of developers and designers and stuff. Um, but that's what kind of got me into the industry. Um, and then I tried my hand at a few other things that didn't work out so well. <laughs> um, and then I just came back to, to where I'd begun in, in digital and, and kind of, uh, joined uh, an agency that was bought by WPP and then stayed with WPP for a long time, um, for almost a decade, in fact. Um, and then I'm sort of am where I'm now. But yeah, so it's kind of been a bit of a twisty, turny road, but a, a fun one nonetheless. <laughs> what uh, what were one of the things that, that failed? Um, so <laughs> I'll give you one example. Um, so there is a rule. So I live in London um, and there is a rule about marketing um, in the city. You're not allowed to, to go around with billboards or, or leaflets or flyers or anything like that, um, which, of course, le- leaves a, a kind of gap or an opportunity. So we figured out that uh, you could advertise on the side of a vehicle uh, as long as the vehicle's primary purpose was not marketing. So we set up a, a company called On Your Bike Advertising. Um, which basically had a, it's like a bus stop A board attached to the back of a, a bike, and you kind of lie back on this thing and cycle around. Um, and basically, their jobs were uh, delivery drivers. And um, they had one package a day that they had to deliver, and it just took them eight hours to do it. Um, so, we, so we were able to market. <laughs> so we were able to market in um, in the city as a result of that. And actually, we did we did quite well. We got we, our first three clients, I think, were M and S. Hamleys, um, and I think it was Debenhams at the time. Um, but to, to be honest, there just wasn't enough margin in it. And we could never scale it up uh, to be to be a successful business. So we just sold the, the, the bikes in the end and gave it up. Um, mm. But it was fun. It was fun. It just didn't go how we wanted yeah. to do, but it was all right. Oh, I love that. That's a, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a big thing now, at least here, is advertising and like the bikes because there's so many delivery drivers who are, actually delivery drivers now <laughs> i mean that's probably that's probably the idea we should have gone with like <laughs> yeah get, get, food, get, actual, <laughs> get actual delivery delivery drivers. actually probably the, the the biggest learning curve and I've, I've done quite a few things in my time um started up quite a few ideas um i think there's two that sort of spring to mind. One was a coffee company that, that I'd got involved with um, at, a, at a roasting level. Um, and the second was a, an idea for a website called Rent-A-Dog. Um, and I, ironic, <coughs> sorry, ironically, with both of the ideas, we were just a little bit too early. Um, and I think it spoke volumes to me about um, needing a market. It's not enough just to have a good idea. You need to have an active market that actually wants to buy the product that you're selling. Um, and sometimes I think we can get carried away with innovations that seem to be useful to us um, or exciting. But ultimately, if people won't buy them, there's no point having them. Um, and yeah, 
admittedly coffee has become a massive thing in the UK and I'm sure elsewhere. Um, and uh, there are now plenty of websites where you can rent people's pets and kind of take them for a weekend and stuff. Um, but it just wasn't the right time and there weren't, you know, there weren't any active buyers in the market. So, so how would you approach kind of avoiding that now? Like what would, you know, like obviously lesson learned, there has to be a market. Um, what's your, what would be your approach to making sure there actually is a market um, and that there's value in your idea? Yeah. I mean, there's that famous quote who I will misquote now. I'm not entirely sure who it's from, but it's, you know, the best way to make the future is to create it. I think it was Drucker or someone like that, but um, I can't actually remember. Um, I agree with that to a degree, but I think you as a, as a brand, if you're innovating particularly, you need to have the capital to make an innovation that isn't necessarily quite there yet in terms of demand um, to make people aware of it. Uh, because ultimately a lot of people just simply aren't aware of new innovations when they come about. So, um, you know, people aren't actively going out of their way to find what it is that you have. You need to go out of your way to let them know you have it. Um, so for me, it's about, yes, we do want to try and create the future. Yes, we do want to try and innovate and uh, in the context of marketing, at least, um, uh, find opportunities to better sell to and serve audiences. Um, we need to make sure that they're, is an appetite or at least a problem that we're solving. Um, so for me, like research is just the obvious place to start, but really getting a, a sense of what it, what is it that audiences need to solve? What, what are the problems that they face on a day-to-day basis? And how does my product or service actually genuinely solve that for them? Um, and if it doesn't, how do I change it? Um, but I think the active market has to be there. Um, otherwise you're, well, unless you've got endless, uh, <laughs> budgets to uh, to throw at making people aware of it yeah. I mean, the, the fairly obvious response i guess would be the abundance of data and channels available to us today um you know it's certainly early on in my career it was relatively straightforward you know there were there were a limited number of channels even from a purely digital perspective there was you know facebook twitter um, you know, YouTube, that, that was kind of it. There wasn't this, this just kind of abundance of variety. Um, and I think as, as that abundance has manifest, we, we've seen, you know, the rise of things like Omnichannel and um, this desire for kind of real personal segment, you know, personalization and segmentation and getting under the skin of audiences. What are they buying? What do they want? Um, and then serving that up to them. Um, I think that that would be the biggest or the fastest shift, I guess, in the last five years. I think looking forward, I actually think we're going to see some of that unraveling. Um, and actually, I wouldn't be the first to say this. Gartner uh, said something along the lines of, um, you know, by 2026, 80% of uh, organizations will abandon all efforts for a 360 degree customer view because they, I'm going to get this wrong, but I think it's like, because they flout data regulation, uh, privacy regulations um, and erode customer trust. And, and, I don't know if they're right. I mean, it's it's hard to tell, to be honest. I think a lot of kind of the pursuit of a 360 degree customer view is expensive and takes time. And I think what we're actually seeing is a shift from anything long-term to short-term, partly because of COVID and companies having to react quickly. Um, but I do think that there is a point to w- at which data privacy will become such a thing that a lot of the, the, the growth with the, we've experienced in the last five years will start to kind of unravel and unwind. Um, and we'll almost have to go back to um, everything being driven by like a deep universal human truth that um, is, is generally true of our entire audience. And yes, we will still want to, as best we can, personalize that story for the individual, but whether we will be able to on the, on the kind of scale that we want to, is the question and it'll become expensive to do so mm. do you see that places a bigger role on on the brand itself but also uh, the messaging that you have and and or is it am i kind of getting it getting it a bit wrong on that no I, I think you're right i think it's one of the the interesting challenges of the digital industry is that we've almost you know, and I've, I've been guilty of this in the past myself, but almost dismissed kind of traditional brand, traditional advertising. Um, but actually what we need to recognize is that people still buy brands. 
uh, yes, they typically do that through digital channels these days. And, um, you know, experience is the number one driver of brand preference, but it's still a brand people are buying. Um, so we need to be cognizant of that and, and make sure that we're kind of uh, coming at it from top down and bottom up at the same time, not just a bottom up approach, which I think we've seen a lot, a lot of um, in the last few years, particularly in the digital space. When you say bottom up, you mean like let's pick channels and what we do and and then like just kind of a spray and pray rather than get that kind of core, more traditional, like deep understanding of customer and, you know, the messaging, right? What re resonates with them? And you I mean, you brought it up really nicely at, earlier around, you know, understanding the person and yeah. then from that, then building out where the channels are or and like, is that basically when you say bottom up is that what you what you mean yeah yeah pretty much i mean i think it um i like to sort of refer to what i call a, a brief history of planning um uh, i actually talk about it in a, in a book that i'm writing at the moment and it, what we saw in the early days was a was a split between what i'd call conceptual planners who traditionally find the home and creative agencies and like to talk about deep universal human truths and, and essences and things like that versus the practical planner that's much more data-led behavioral um, behavioral sciences um, and we see these as two distinct and separate things and actually for me I think there's there needs to be a blend of these two things because we do need the data to enrich what it is we're doing but we also need the brand thinking that you know a deep universal human truth can allow us um, and typically these two things sit in silos, you know, once it's in a digital agency, once it's in a creative agency, and mm. in my mind, there needs to be a hybrid of the two for, for us to actually be successful. Um, that's probably the easiest way to explain it. Well, I think actually one of the things that we've seen as a result of, uh, as a result of COVID particularly, um, is obviously an acceleration towards digital. I think a lot of organizations who historically argued that they'd never sell direct customer, for example, um, suddenly recognizing that not only is there an opportunity to, but almost a demand. Um, you know, you can look at the statistics, they speak for themselves. I think, you know, um, McKinsey re reported that, I think it was in the US, e-commerce penetration had grown in three months uh, by an amount equal to the entire decade that preceded it, right? That's a huge growth in, in, in e-commerce. Um, and of course, yes, a lot of that is driven by marketplace. Um, yeah. Amazon and, and, and others, but I think there is a huge opportunity for DTC. So in terms of the what I think we'll see more of in the future is a continuing adoption of um, composable architectures, things that just allow brands to adapt quickly, to build quickly, to test and learn. Um, but equally, what I'm hoping um, secretly, because it means my job becomes more interesting, um, is, is a a continuous drive towards what I would call explorers versus exploiters. So the, the concept is quite simple. It's um, th there's two kind of schools of thought when it comes to business management, right? Um, yeah. This is a massive generalization, but um, there's kind of revenue, uh, uh, there's um, revenue expan expansion, um, and then there's cost reduction. Um, and actually, if you look at the data, cost reduction never actually works. It never drives long-term sustainable revenue. Um, or even margin for that matter. So what I, th what I hope we'll continue to see as a result of COVID is an adoption into digital, adoption into more composable type architectures, and actually by extension, uh, a more aggressive focus on innovation and the need to, 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 to expand revenue, not just bring in a big piece of technology and you know, make things more efficient. Okay, that's great, but it's boring. Um, and it doesn't lead to the results that people expect it to. Um, and instead, replace that with like small, nimble ideas that we can just throw out into the market, test, see if we get traction and, and kind of iterate from there. That's what I'm hoping anyway. Whether or not that will happen, yeah. we'll, we'll get to be seen. <laughs> uh, do you know, I, I think for me, there's a there's a there's still a big gap in the industry. Um, and... Few of us are, well, some of us are painfully aware of it. Few of us do too much about it. But um, I think there is a lack of academic learning uh, specifically around um, marketing and digital and, and um, 
you know, you can see it in, in the way that we talk about things. You know, we, we seem to think that empathy is enough of a qualification to, to mean we can solve any kind of, you know, brand experience problem. Um, it's not. Um, uh, so my encouragement would be, you know, buy some old books, go in, go and get, uh, I don't know, um, Peter Drucker, David A. Aker, Stephen King, go and buy some of these authors. They're all dead now. Um, but I think that's a good thing as well. You know, this, this is traditional marketing theory. Go and read them. Um, because actually, I think a lot of the words that we use and spout about as new, like customer centricity, like, you know, Drucker is famous for talking about the only thing that matters in business is a customer. And that was 50 years ago. And we seem to think it's this new idea, you know, customer centricity It's not. Um, so go and read some of the old traditional kind of marketing literature um, out there. Uh, particularly on the academic side, and then apply all the brilliant things there are to learn about digital and data and you know technology and stuff like that to that marketing theory, because I think the two need to come together. I, I don't think you can have one without the other. Um, so yeah, to read as much as you can, that would be my advice. <laughs> I think there's some basic marketing theory that everyone has to have. Um, and actually business theory as well. I don't think it's it's reserved to marketing. Um, you know, I think this is just anecdotal, but in my career, most of the colleagues that I have, you know, worked with have admitted in one way or another falling into marketing. It's one of those categories where you just get a lot of people who seem to fall into it for some reason. Um, and it's, you know, it's a great career. It's a great industry to be in but it's not necessarily the one you had in mind when you were at school, when you were at university, right? It often comes after that when you're kind of thinking, well, I, you know, I'm passionate about people or about this and, and you kind of somehow fall into it. Um, but as a result of that, often the, the academic side of things isn't there. Um, and so for me, the gap is purely, let me, let me give you an example, actually. Um, you know, I often work with uh, big global brands, um, you know, been involved in above the line campaigns, below the line campaigns, everything in between, uh, digital experiences, digital transformation. But a lot of the brand managers I speak to, you know, they'll be talking, they'll be talking about, um, you know, repositioning their brand and suddenly talking about something entirely different. Now, anyone with a, 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 an understanding of marketing theory would know that when new information is introduced to someone that doesn't fit with what they already think or feel about a brand, they're likely to just dismiss it or distort it until it does fit. And that's, that's just basic marketing theory, right? But because people are unaware of that fact, they kind of naively assume, oh, we can change someone's mind about a brand. It's like, well, it's not that simple. Actually, we need to recognize why people buy brands, how they buy brands, uh, what motivates them to do that, and how, they, how what they think will never change that quickly. So there, there are ways of doing it, of course. I mean, that's how advertising works and how marketing works. But um, without that kind of grounding in... I think marketing theory, I think we, I typically come across uh, both both within the, the industry and, and clients as well, um, people who just don't recognize some of the, the basic challenges of what it is we need to solve. Um, and then they wonder why the results aren't as good as they should be. <laughs> <laughs>